Hello and a very warm welcome to today's session. My name is Natasha Lawrence uh, from One Team Logic. I'm the safeguarding manager and I manage a team of safeguarding trainers. So I'm going to shortly allow Luke to introduce himself, but today's session we're going to have a look at transforming, transforming pastoral care at St Benedict's, the move from reactive to proactive strategies, and there will be an opportunity at the end to ask some questions. So over to Luke. Uh, please introduce yourself. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Luke Ramsden. I'm Senior Deputy Head at St Benedict's School and also the Safeguarding Lead, and I've been there for four and a half years now. Um, it's an all through school in West London, around a thousand students. Um, and so uh, all of those issues that you'd expect with a, a very large school in an urban setting. Uh, and we've been working with One Team Logic in my concern uh, for most of those four and a half years. Thank you, Luke. Uh, and it is a lovely school. I have visited a couple of times. Um, so let's have a look at, um, so you, you've been using my concern for some time. Um, how has this enabled St Benedict's to spot potential issues that otherwise might have gone unnoticed? Well, first of all, just to put into a, a bit of context, I think the key thing that we found using my concern is that what we've, what, and what I'll be focusing on today is the way in which we've really built up what is a really large bank of information, data, about what happens pastorally in a school. And so that's something I'm going to go on to look at a bit later about the fact that you can actually start to gather really interesting sort of patterns and, bit, and, and information about what's happening over a very, quite a large time frame and over for certain students, but also entire year groups in the entire school. In the first instance though, what using a system like this allows you to do is to um, make sure that all the right people in the school have the right information and that for me was the first thing that made, made it clear to me that as a safeguarding lead, an incoming safeguarding lead, that we needed to have a digital way of storing this information. Um, now, most schools are moving beyond the idea of just having you know, the filing cabinet in the corner but I think what some schools are not necessarily always doing is really giving full um, justice to what a digital storage platform can do. So for example I think there are many schools where the safeguarding leads have access and the heads of the year have access to all of this information. Whereas what these systems can do is they can give you really um, fine tuned ways of passing on information. So for example, individual tutors can have access to just the information for people in their tutor group. Heads of the year can have information about people just in their year groups. If you've got uh, school counsellors or school mentors, you can give them access to the information about the students in their mentor groups and their counselling groups. So actually one of the things that I found on the very first instance of using uh, my concern is that what it means is everybody is getting the right information and that is particularly useful in a time of GDPR when people are very and rightly nervous about what you do with data, um, really concerned to make sure that you know, the wrong people aren't getting it. And so that was the first thing that really drew me to it was that all the right people know the right things. Thank you. Um, and when you're looking about capturing that data, what types of things are you encouraging your staff to, to input? Well, the phrase that we use a lot at school is about the, the little pieces of the jigsaw. And we're saying to staff, put anything in that you want to put in. Now, it's a very uh, intuitive system um, and you just literally put the name of a student in, what the detail is, you know, it can be a cup, just a sentence, and then that gets sent off to all the right people, as I said. And it could be something as little as you know, X was looking maybe upset in my class. They never usually look upset. Or maybe you're on duty at lunchtime and somebody you know, didn't have their lunch. They were in the queue, but they decided not to buy anything. That's unusual. And so we really encourage our staff to notice all these little things, because what we say to the staff is then these little bits of the jigsaw, the little pieces around what a student is doing can be picked up. And there are innumerable, innumerable examples over the years of students where maybe one member of staff said something on a Monday, they looked a bit upset. Maybe it was followed up on a Wednesday by a totally different member of staff, which meant that by Thursday, maybe somebody else said something. The head of the year knows there's clearly something going on. Let's have a talk with that student. And it's the kind of thing that would otherwise have not been picked up. And it's really getting ahead of the game. And that's the key thing I'm talking about today is making sure that you can be proactive rather than reactive to issues. And if you can start to pick up issues before they become a major problem, 
or before you know, a crisis point has been reached. That's the, the way to be really effective in terms of safeguarding pastoral care, is to have noted an issue, perhaps even before the student or certainly the parent has noticed a major issue, and you're able to go in and, and do something about it. Mm, thank you. And it is so important to get those small bits of information into the system. How do you go about um, empowering your staff to be confident in, in using the system and, and putting that information on? Well, I think the key thing that is really um, thorough training from the start and so making them really aware of how to use it um, and in crucially how you're going to use it in your school. One of the important things for any school thinking of um, using uh, one of these sort of systems is to have really clear protocols of how you're going to use it so that all the staff are absolutely aware you know, when you put something on, um, how you should put it on. Because so, if you can have a sort of, not totally standardised, but a clear idea of how you're going to do it as your school, then that will help them. The other thing is on a very personal level, knowing that they have the backing of um, the, the senior team and the, and the pastoral leads. So if they put something down, um, then you know you will support them. They will be supported in having uh, made those kind of, uh, sort of concerns. And the key word we always say to the teachers is about being objective. You can really write anything you need to down or anything you want to down, as long as you haven't made an opinion. It's a bit like when you make a referral. Um, because otherwise, if you're making an opinion about a, a topic, then that could potentially be an issue and you'll just say, I think this is the issue. If you're just saying X has said this, or this seems to be the case, then I always stress to my staff, you can say anything you want. GDPR, of course, doesn't apply when it comes to safeguarding. And so all the staff at St. Benedict's are fully aware that they are really backed to put whatever they feel is a problem down and that there won't be any sort of negative consequences for that as long as they've made an objective, you know, clear judgment in what's happening. Fantastic. Yep. Yeah, it's it's asking yourself, well, what happens if I do compared to yes. what happens if I actually don't put that information in? Yeah, yes, absolutely. absolutely. Thank you. So um, you're collating all this uh, fantastic information and that uh, goes on around the, the pupil, around the child. So what about looking back on, on historical records? Well, that's one of the things that's really helpful in particular in a large school um, and with, you know, as ever with schools, a turnover of staff. Let's say, for instance, somebody who joined you in year seven, um, maybe they're now in year 11. They're perhaps now approaching GCSEs. They're starting to have real anxiety issues. Um, you can't quite work out why this is. If you've got the old system of you know, having a paper file somewhere or indeed not noting all the little bits of issues down, then maybe you don't have any context for this. But imagine with my concern, this happens regularly. You might look over a chronology of this student and perhaps in year 10 before their summer exams maybe it says they got really quite anxious maybe it happened in year eight as well maybe in year seven you've got it clearly set out that you know perhaps you know for a couple of days they were school refusing because they were so anxious what you've got there is a really clear record that whoever's picked them up as tutor will be able to see they won't have to go digging around for it it's right there in front of them on the uh, on the on the platform and so they can instantly go Actually, no, I, I know what's hap happening here. This has clearly been an issue in the past. We need to take this seriously. And also what you'd hope for is that going into year 11, we might have, as we can often do, we might be able to predict that this is what might happen. And this is where I, the, the, the thing I want to talk about today you know, as a real focus is the sense of how you can predict patterns. And certainly it's something you can do with individuals. So going into year 11, we go back through the records and we say, right, year 11, really high anxiety, particularly this year, you know, are they even going to be doing their exams? And so we go through their chronologies and say, who is likely to be anxious? New things might arise, but you, it's, it's likely that if there's a student who has a history of anxiety issues, that this might resurface in, in year 11 and the, uh, the real anxiety is approaching GCSEs. And so preemptively, we have support groups and our counsellor over the years has run a number of different groups where they talk through their issues and they, they talk through potential anxieties and can support each other and do that before a problem arises. So again, having that really clear historical record of issues means that whatever your turnover of staff, whoever's taken over a group, they know what's happening. But also you can start as, a, as the senior team, as the pastoral leadership, to be able to think, how do we stop there being a problem in the future? Mm. Fantastic. So not only being proactive with that data, but also um, implementing all those support groups and counselling, but then also with the data, seeing the results. So seeing how beneficial it was in implementing all of that. 
Yes, and the results are quite important, particularly when you're talking to governors. Um, mm. So being able to quantify these things, I know it seems almost counterintuitive to talk about quantifying pastoral issues, but actually if you're talking to governors, particularly about resources, so for example, when we talk to the governors about putting extra resources into pastoral training, um, putting resources into having a, a more full-time council as we did um, a number of years ago now, if we were able to say, here are the number of issues to do with anxiety, here are the number of issues to do with um, sort of mental health issues, this is why we need a full-time counsellor, then the governors can really understand that. You know, they're not on the ground in the school, but having those sort of quantifiable reports, again, are really useful. So for instance, going into this summer, to this new Michaelmas term, we're able to explain to the governors that there'd been a significant rise of anxiety issues um, over the lockdown. Not surprising, but we're able to quantify it and say this is how many there are. So we could say we need um, training support for new members of staff to be able to be student mentors. And so the, the, and that needed meant that we would have more people covering for those staff on duties. They would be able to spend the money of doing the training. So the governors are very happy to do that because they were very clear on how you're spending your resources and the need for that. So it means that at St. Benedict's now we've essentially got five councillors, um, which preempted what was a really big spike in, you won't be surprised today, a really big spike mm -hmm. in concerns about anxiety, mental health concerns as the students returned um, to St. Benedict's, but we were able to preempt that there would be that spike and act accordingly. Thank you. Um, and I, I believe you've also been able to uh, implement some more mental health first aiders within your school. Yes, so mental health first aid is something I know a lot of uh, independent schools are really buying into and absolutely. I, I think the key thing there is I'm explaining to the staff about how they can uh, take ownership of you know, looking after students with pastoral issues and mental health issues. And one of the how that links back into the, looking at data that is collected is that there can be a temptation amongst staff, particularly you know, if you read in the press and rightly so, they say anxiety levels are reaching critical um, uh, amount and they're spiking all over the country. What we're able to do with the staff though is quite nice is to explain precisely what the problems are. And so rather than just having a generic sense of uh, there's a lot of anxiety around, we can say to the staff, first of all, we're going to train you, we're going to do mental health first aid to help you deal with it. But also we can, again, quantify again, can be quite helpful. We can say, well, actually, this is the amount of an issue that there is. What it helps is the sense of this is a, you know, it can be dealt with. So you know, let's say there are a lot of people being anxious, but we can say no, there are 20 in year 11. This is how we're going to break it down. We'll have them in, in smaller groups. This is how we're going to support them. And it really gives the staff you know, and all, all the staff this real sense of you know, we are in control of the situation. It can be a real sense, particularly in, in this sort of lockdown COVID situation of basically a tidal wave of anxiety. What are we going to do? Whereas actually being able to break it down into these are the issues. Now, this is the number of girls with these particular issues, this is the number of boys in the year group, this is how we're going to split them up into groups, that the staff feel reassured that we understand the situation, that we're in control of the situation and can deal with it. And I think, again, quantifying the problem can really help with that. Really important. So talking about breaking down that data, can you tell me a little bit more about how you break that data down within your reports? So uh, a good example of that is, um, sticking with the idea of anxiety is that we obviously were able to talk in big pictures about you know, the number of people in a year group having with anxiety issues but also actually when then this is where categorizing is quite important and certainly I would say if you're going to have a system like this that really works it is important again talking about investment of resources to have somebody who is keeping the system ticking over it doesn't necessarily need to be their full-time job but I would definitely recommend somebody who is going into the system every day and checking about how you're categorizing the different things that are coming in, making sure that the entries are going to the right year groups, you know, tidying up, keeping the system um, in check. But in particular, the categorizing is important so that there's a real sense of clarity of you know, where the, what these issues are for. Is it counting as an anxiety issue or a bullying issue or how is it going to be recorded? Because once you've got that information there, you can really go into quite granular detail of what's going on. So for instance, um, looking at, at the issue of anxiety, what are they actually being anxious about? Um, and so mm. the interesting thing looking at it was that the staff were very convinced that it was all about 
um, this is going back three or four years ago, is that anxiety was all about academic pressure and um, that it was, you know, should we perhaps you know, do fewer tracking tests? Maybe you know, the academic pressure is the thing that's really um, really sort of the problem. But in fact, mm. looking at these issues, it turned out to be far more about other things. And in fact, understanding in each of these cases that actually it was far more to do with issues about body image and issues about social groups and issues about family concerns, which sometimes were prompted by, I've got exams coming up, it's sort of triggering my anxieties. But again, we're able to say that we can see that the, most of the anxieties are to do with these other things. And actually, it's we need to treat these other things, obviously support them in their exams, support them academically, but actually supporting them in these other things, that's the key to getting the right support in place. So again, that categorizing and understanding exactly what's going on um, with the data that you're getting. And that, that's the crucial thing. I think it's quite easy to look at it and go, well, no, are you just not looking at graphs? Is it all a bit soulless? There's the other really important part is having pastoral leads and the heads of year and teachers who know their students really well, who can interpret what's happening, who can look at this yeah. data coming in. Like, this is the best thing to do about it. I think another even better example, though, and something where I think we've really seen great strides in the school is looking at bullying concerns. The first thing I did when we we're looking at bullying concerns is that I was very, very keen to emphasize to the staff to have like almost over report. It's very tempting for schools to try and minimize bullying issues. You know, you, if you read through the good schools guide, the number of heads who will say no, 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 bush, no bullying issues here at all. No, we just don't have that. Okay, this seems unlikely to me. Whereas I always say to staff, if it's potentially a bullying issue, you know, somebody shoved somebody over, they said it was an accident, maybe it was, maybe it wasn't, we'll put it as potentially a bullying concern. Because then you know, we go back to the idea of a little piece of a jigsaw. If that happens a number of times over the next few months, maybe it's saying mm. that's happened quite a lot. I don't think that is an accident. But also what you're able to do, and talking about preempting possible issues, is you're able to put together a, a, um, a, a lots of data about you know, little times when you know, there's friction between year groups. Maybe it's not full-blown crisis point, no, no, uh, serious bullying, but of course that's not what you want to be dealing with. You want to be dealing with the little issues before they become more serious. And so what we were able to do is not only show, for example, on the bigger picture, we were able to see that each year, this is after a couple of years of using my concern, there was a very big spike in bullying issues, these little bullying issues in October and November. And we actually did a student survey and talked to the students about this. It turned out a lot of it was to do with um, you know, just people settling their new teacher groups. And if you like deciding if they didn't like somebody or not. So for a, you've got a, a Halloween period of a few weeks where they're all getting along fine. <laughs> But then they sort of settle into, particularly as seven and eight, actually, I don't really like that person. And they don't necessarily have the maturity to understand how to deal with that. So by the end of the month, by October, November, they're sort of pushing against each other and you start to have these issues. So what we did um, a couple of years ago is we preempted that. And we had a really big push in PSHE, in assemblies, in what the tutors are talking about to their students about how to get on as, as tutor groups, how to deal with it when you're not being friends with somebody. And we saw a really dramatic reduction in that spike of bullying concerns in October and November. So that's the bigger picture. But I think what's really interesting, and this is, I'd have to say, this is only when you've got a system where you've used it for a while. I mean, you need to have quite a lot of data um, yes. to, to be able to look at it in this detail about where and when these issues were happening. And we've started to really, in quite fine detail, remodel what we're doing as a school to deal with potential flashpoints and bullying errors. So, for instance, you teachers will be unsurprised to note that a number of these flashpoints were happening in a, quite a large boys' toilet that was in the, the centre of the school. And what we did was he totally remodelled it. It's now a series of separate different cubicles, um, uh, and so totally so, uh, with their own wash basin and, and thing in it. And the central area is sort of rather nice little reception bit. And so it's much more. You know, you're, you're individually in the, in the loo. You're not actually there as a group. And so mm -hmm. lo and behold, having remodeled how the loos were, um, all of those flashpoints stopped. Mm -hmm. Similarly, we changed where people were on duty. So we had the staff being on duty at break and lunchtime in certain areas. And we could see there was these sort of little areas sort of slightly just off the radar, you know, round the corner by the science block, that kind of thing. So even mm -hmm. just saying to members of staff, 
when you're on duty, check this bit here, then it meant they were able to, again, spot those areas, those little you know, black spots, which are all perhaps off the, off the beaten track where students were you know, having these little issues. And again, those sort of things, again, dramatically reducing the number of issues we're tending to face. Mm. And the same thing has been very helpful with the recent, you know, with COVID, I, I think a lot of past leads would have found this, coming back from six months out of school, there are a lot of year sevens in particular coming to a new school anyway, and year eights as well, a long time for them out of school. We had a huge amount as they come in just of the day-to-day -day friction of students who are not used to being in a crowd of 20 of them, just not being as patient, as tolerant, as willing to put up with other people as you would imagine. So we had a very busy September, mm. but we, just, we thought this might happen, but also seeing that we were able to very quickly sit down at the end of September and say, okay, where are these flashpoints? And in particular mm. with the different bubbles that we've got within the student groups, rearrange them, put them into different areas, maybe work out if there's two different year groups having friction with each other, um, where we put them in different parts of the playground. And so we've seen from a very large spike in September, we're now back to you know, below normal levels uh, of, of you know, friction between students um, into November. So again, a lot of these things are things that would be happening in schools anyway, but we do have a really clear picture of what, when and where these sort of issues are happening which really mm. helps us you know, put in place exactly the right strategies to make sure that we don't have those issues going forward and can preempt those issues. Fantastic stuff. And that where, that location, that can be captured within the system as well, can't it, Luke? So you can actually yeah, identify I mean, those flashpoints. And that's the really real beauty of a system, mm -hmm. uh, of these systems, is that you, know, you can put as much information as you want in it, almost, mm. because it's very, you know, you, um, and so, the, the, the exact timings. So for a, a, an example would be that we've been looking at, um, you know, in terms of behaviour concerns, where we would support our cover teachers. Unsurprisingly, at many other schools, we've got a lot of cover teachers in. We've got, I think, <clears throat> seven teachers off at the moment, um, waiting for COVID tests and things. So we've got far more cover teachers than ever we would normally use. So what we're trying to work out is where we should you know, be dropping into lessons, where there are particular issues. And so we've been able to work out quite surprised me this I thought it'd be Friday afternoon but the Wednesday periods three and four are when students wow. pick up the most media points oh not quite and we're, we're going to look into why that is it's an interesting question itself but what we do now know is that on I'll Wednesday be keen period, to know the results on that <laughs> <laughs> on Wednesday periods three and four we make sure the senior team do basically a learning walk going around all the cover teacher lessons so that because we can predict that you know, that seems to be when the students are most uh, bouncy at that particular mm. time and we know that that's a good time to have the senior staff around and about the place to support our cover teachers. So again, we can do, it's not just long-term patterns, we can quite quickly look at short-term issues and see very quickly exactly where the problems are. Some really great examples and results there. Thank you, Luke. Just taking you back to um, inputting a concerns um, around an individual, and you spoke about bullying. Um, are you able to link individuals within the system? Yes, yeah, so, and that's another thing which is quite useful, you know, as above the, the piece of paper, is that when you put a concern in, you can simply put, you know, are there other people involved in this case? But also, much more usefully, in a sense, is that you know, are there family members involved? So let's say, for instance, somebody looking upset in class, it might be very useful to put, you know, if they've got a brother or sister in the class, link them in. Because either the tutor of that brother or sister might think, okay, their brother, their brother or sister doesn't look so happy. I wonder if that's linking in. But also it might flag up something that otherwise that tutor wouldn't know. Let's say in year seven, a student's looking unhappy. You link it in with year 12, um, a sister there, and their, their, their sister is, they have, they have, has got you no know, real anxiety about exams, maybe has an issue, you know, an eating disorder, that you're making links. And that mm. even if they've been missed by individuals, links that a tutor can then say, right, I, I can quite see why this is. They might then flag up and say, this boy unsurprisingly looks unhappy. Actually, maybe they should get some support, that's a wider support because their sister's really unwell. And you can start to build in all those levels of support in a way which you know, it's just occurring naturally with the system pulling out that information for you. Mm. Thank you. So um, coming towards the end, in close, is there anything further you'd like to add? I think the key thing about systems like this is, going right back to the beginning, 
is giving and, and, and the, you know, the intuitive nature of this kind of technology now makes it a lot easier is to really explain to staff, um, not just that it's an easy system to use, but to explain the use that they can get out of it. I think the reason it's had such good take up at St. Benedict's um, and other schools I've, I've, I've worked with on this is that they, the teachers can see how helpful it is, not only for the students, which is vital, of course, students at the centre in terms of getting the right support to them, but also in empowering the teachers. One of the biggest changes I think we've made in terms of how teachers feel is that they are now trusted with information that otherwise previously they wouldn't have had. Again, I think moving on from that days of the filing cabinet of the DSL, tutors at St. Benedict's now have access to all of the relevant information about their students. Those days of there's a mysterious issue that you, won't, you, you don't need to know about are long gone. And I think that's really important and trusting colleagues that even if it's quite a significant issue, if they're the tutor of that student, and particularly with independent sector, with tutors being such a vital role in all schools, um, trusting them to say, this is important information, this is really quite serious information, but as their tutor, you have to know it. And having the confidence to be able to give that to the right people, but that colleagues are trusted with it, has I felt given a real sense of empowerment to our tutors. And I think once you've done that, they will really enthusiastically buy into the system that you've got. And I think that's why you get this really virtuous circle. If you trust the teacher, you say, we want to, you to have an input into it, and they do, and so the system works. Thank you so much, Luke, for your time today. It's been really great hearing um, all about uh, the um, practical um, things that you're implementing on, on the back of that uh, data coming out. So it's really great to hear some great results there. So thank you very much for listening in and um, please use the chat function for any questions. Um, thank you very much. Thank you.